Hi, welcome to Think Tech. We are raising public awareness on technology, energy, diversity, and globalism. This show is Center Stage. I'm your host, Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kuma Kuhua Theater. And we are coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, very near Kumu Kuhua Theater. Before we get started here today, I'd like to let you know that if you would like to join in the conversation, if you have any questions or comments, you can get those to us in real time by tweeting at ThinkTechHI, that's us. Today I am talking with artist Michael Yano, who has some very interesting work and an interesting story that um, I heard him start to tell at a dinner the other night, and I said, I want to have you on my show and talk about that some more. So I'd like to introduce you to Michael Yano. Thank you for being here, Michael. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. And to share uh, aspects of why and how and my art. Well, that's what I would. That's what I like to talk with artists about: why and how. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because cool. I think that uh, I always, uh, I'm gonna say, I almost always find the how very interesting. How it is that you do what you do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whether I'm talking with someone who is a, a painter or sculptor or a sound mixer on the radio, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the why is. The really the meat of the conversation, as far as I'm concerned. So we're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna work our way into that, though. So first of all, let's talk about the what. Can you tell us what it is that you do? I have always found the most purposeful intention of creating art to be communication. And. Without a, a interaction of communication between a viewer and the piece, um, gives the piece life. It becomes alive, especially when somebody likes it well enough to live with it, bring it home and live with it for a lifetime, and find calmness, peacefulness that when a viewer really participates by lingering and contemplating the work, if they can be drawn into the image within themselves of their own calm, then automatically stress releases. When stress releases, physiologically, inflammation, relaxation goes down, more de-stressing. When that's happening, every cell becomes more alive and begins to heal more. So calm is the healer. And that's what you're working to bring about in your In my paintings. work. That's the intention and purpose. OK. Yeah. Because some paintings are very, there's some paintings that are very exciting to look at. You know, you see a, a painting and you just want to stare at it and say, oh, what's going on there? And you get into it. And I think that there is a, there's a, a calm that comes with that introspection, e even when the work can be very tumultuous and you know, vibrant and angular and all of those things. Mm -hmm. There's a different kind of, it's this, the communication that you're talking about is certainly there. Um, uh, but what is being communic what is being communicated can be very different. But mm -hmm. I, th I think, am, am I? Let me let me know. Let me know if you don't agree with me that the same sort of um, that sort of uh, evaluation of what a piece is saying to you is calming, even when you're looking at something that's exciting. That's interesting dynamic comparison. Um, it's a pair of opposites. As it stimulates, it calms. Well, since my ad early adulthood, calm has been important to me. And there are periods where within myself, different experiences causing different feelings and emotions, which color the innate calmness that I've always just naturally seems to come out. And those put a tint 
on the calmness can be sadness, can be forlorn sadness, can be exhilaratingly happy just beyond the calm. But a balance in the image of color and proportion of color, intensity of depth, can draw a person into the um, uh, image to interact, as we spoke of earlier. And um, that, that um, those variable, varied aspects of what is being expressed comes through different types of experiences. Mm. Yeah. So do you feel like, we'll look at some of your art in just a moment, do you f feel like you are painting with a purpose to elicit a reaction from people viewing your paintings? The reaction that is um, very uh, fulfilling for me is having a relationship with between the viewer, participant viewer, who lingers and participates, um, that uh, when that occurs, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it gives a purposeful life to the piece. And it, when somebody connects to it in the manner of expression that had come out from me, then they are communicating through the painting to me and I to them. Yeah. And that becomes further life of the work. Do you feel like you are trying to shape that when you are actually doing the painting itself? I just express what just comes out to me. First I observe subject matter, go into the studio and just paint what comes out. So when that happens, it's like, just let the image develop itself. And as you pause and look, other certain things may suggest themselves to strengthen or soften uh, the image. Mm -hmm. And so I allow this interaction with myself in the image. And sometimes the impact of the image is different from what I even intended, but that's okay. That's how the image came to be. And as far as intended interpretation through a viewer, I enjoy it when there's ambiguity, ambi ambiguity and freedom for the viewer to find things in the paintings. Oftentimes what I don't even see or intended. Mm. And when they start describing, oh, I see this, I see that, and. You know, and I'm just enjoying the fact that um, they're really having a relationship with the image within themselves. Then it works. Then it's a successful piece. Yeah. And only then. So if you painted something for yourself, mm -hmm. if you painted something and you chose to keep it in your home yeah. and not show it to other people, it's not successful? No, because in my home, people you know, would be coming, visiting, coming to the home. To Should they choose to linger on a, a piece that I save, then it's fun to observe their interaction. Anytime I can observe someone's inner relationship with a piece, it's really, um, it's gratifying and eye-opening. Yeah, to see I how they react. Yeah. But if you, d if you painted something and you kept it in a drawer and you pulled it out and looked at it, but you didn't let anyone else see it, oh, how okay. would that change the painting for you? It would not be fulfilling the intention and purpose, yeah. which is primary motivation to even be creative and make stuff. So if it's not holding true to that, which is a first principle basis, philosophically, then uh, it is purposeless. So I would rather have it somewhere that I can show 
if not presently, saving it for when I can show a grouping where the impact is more complete. So it will always find an audience one way or the okay. other. Yeah. This is a uh, sort of a reoccurring theme for me that I think as a, a, my initial artistry is as an actor and mm -hmm. you, there is work that you do to become a better actor and then there is work that you do for the actual presentation itself. Mm -hmm. But there is also work that you do whether you are singing or um, playing a musical instrument or painting. I believe in work that you do um, that just makes you, not only makes you a better artist, it's not just to get to an end point, but it is releasing stuff. And whether that is viewed by someone else to me, doesn't matter. In fact, sometimes it's better if nobody else sees it. I've just mm. exercised something. If a work does not find a receptive viewer, uh, it's not, as I mentioned, fulfilling the first principle, which is the intention of communication and affect. Gotcha. OK. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to go to our first break. Uh, please stay with us. We'll be right back with Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Network. Hello, I'm Stephen Katz, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap, which comes to you live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, and then it's repeated again whenever you want if you go to the website. On our show, we will be talking to all different kinds of therapists, psychologists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, people who talk about the mind, the brain, and about different ways to find happiness. Um, I myself am a marriage and family therapist in practice here in Hawaii, and I hope you will join us because I've got a lot to learn, you've got a lot to learn, and it's a great ride. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Aloha. I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday at 3 p.m., we address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Hi, we're back on center stage. If you would ever like to join us in our studio audience here in Pioneer Plaza, you may do that. Just email Jay, that's J-A-Y, at thinktechhawaii.com, and he will hook you up. You can come join us for the show. Um, I'm talking with artist Michael Yano here, and we're going to start um, looking at some of your art now that we've talked about your motivation behind it, and I appreciate your, your talking about that. My question about whether or not a piece is successful if no one sees it is like my own weird thing and I know that it is and I, I have this um, like image in my head that I haven't uh, fully fleshed out yet of um, a therapy that comes from creating art beautiful brilliant fully fleshed out art mm -hmm. and then destroying it and doing it oh. for the creation process itself right, and what right, it does for the artist right, sure sure and to go back to motivation uh, just briefly, um, if a piece happens to be pivotal to the styling I'm doing, a change that I really like, but it occurs in that interactive way with the image that I don't know how to do it again. Mm -hmm. Because it just was at that time that I could see it and paint it that way. So. Being pivotal, I, I save those to look at again. And it becomes a part of the continued oh. creative process for that branch. OK, so that's like a catalog for you. Yeah. To be able to Re go back. Refer and back, yeah. So we're going to look at some of your older pieces. And um, just, just a moment ago, Zuri showed a piece that was kind of abstract and flowy. and. Then we get into pieces like this that are so detailed and so harsh. This looks like two different people. It looks like a completely different person is responsible for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for this painting. Um, it, it, is this where you 
began with your art in, in this more, is this charcoal? Uh, it's a lithograph, oh. Oh. which was drawn on a very smooth grain Bavarian limestone, which is, goes back centuries in method. And you create the image on this limestone, press it through the press with paper, and it comes out like this. Oh, wow. Um, you must have been going through something difficult or communicating something very difficult here. Yeah. Because this is hard to look, I think this is hard to look at. N and not that it's emotionally difficult to look at. I find it intriguing. If this were hanging on someone's wall, I would stop and look at it. But it, there's a lot of emotion in here. Very much. And very subtly in the background, of course, the, the suffering of the figure is so pronounced that it retains the viewer's attention very strongly. But the gate is open. The light is out there. And the name of it is Open Gate, which is very positive. Yes. The gate's there. You shun it, the light, because it's too stressful to have too much light because that becomes interactive with environment and people. And in the depth of depression, any interaction becomes so stressful that you cut yourself off. And this was during a period where I was going through episodes right in the middle of art school, getting incompletes or low marks and you know, not complete benefit of the semester work. And the frustration that came, I was facing the decision, do I stay in school or just forget it? I did hang, I did stick with it. But the coloring, the tinting of meaning and style followed what was occurring inside of me, which in the, in the midst of an episode, I could not create anything but emerging from as ability, uh, both cognizant feeling um, and uh, return of uh, a balanced philosophical theological outlook. Mm. And then the creative process would come, even if it's a lingering depression, the process would start and then images like earlier images that were shown. Um, the lady in her theatrical makeup with a knight in the... This one. This one, yeah. If you see in the dream dark area, there's a knight in the left side. Mm. And she's dramatically thinking about this knight. As many women dream about their ideal and become so sad over a period of time that it doesn't come into their life, even if they're looking for it. But what is not said in that art, but, but that came out within myself was that um, when a person becomes complete in themselves, in every aspect, from physical, spiritual, emotional, when a person becomes complete, they are ready for another person who be, is complete within themselves to, like magnets, it might just happen. When the timing is right, by a knowledge and wisdom that I believe uh, has our life episodes in store. So to get back to the uh, main point, And I lost it. <laughs> I went okay. off into such a tangent. That's that okay, because I have to say, I think that when artwork. a person... Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. You found your point. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can you show the image that you had after the dramatic lady, the night dreamer? Okay, this is... Um, if you look, different forms transition to different objects throughout the image. There's transitions. Sometimes where it seems like something solid, but you look at it in a different way compared to different parts of the image, and sometimes it can become space, depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's it, a lot more going on in here than initially meets the eye. Yeah, and it takes a participant of viewing to really see it. 
and you can come back to it many times and still see more stuff. It's a metamorphosis. Oh, now we're getting in there. Thanks, Suri. <laughs> yeah. And is this lithograph also? Yeah. Oh, I'm staring uh, at the... <laughs> It's okay. Um, I have to say, a, a couple of things occurred to me. One is, you know, I, I uh, very often when I talk with visual artists, um, uh, they talk about the f this fact that what you're going through in life will come out in your art, and it 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 enhances the art. It, it will it will change it to s into something completely different. And mm -hmm. this is what whether you it's it's made. Uh, some of the most profound pieces uh, th that I've seen have come out of um, an emotional state of the artist, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good thing. You're mm -hmm. you're getting it out, but I then I compare it. To, I think of it as an actor. We go through a lot of training to make sure that what is going on at home does not come onto the stage because uh, you're true to a character who is not you, right. who did not go through that upsetting argument, you know, or any of that. We as artists work very hard to not express oh. through our art right. what is going on in our personal lives. So cool. I think that's interesting. And I also think once you become whole unto yourself, the idea that you do that and then this person will show up, to me expresses um, this idea that we we have to be with someone else in order to be yeah. whole, and, and I don't buy that. No, <laughs> if you are complete within yourself, um, your body and mind, emotions and spiritual heart, when they're all in balance, um, it's like a triangle of wellness mm -hmm. and spirituality, wisdom, and willingness to um, to live the way that encourages spirituality within yourself as a foundation it's the most stable right and then you have body care and wellness and mind care and wellness when that is equilibrium you are balanced then you are complete and as you say you don't need the support of another person and that lets a person Come to two people can come together as holes each. They can come together and be so close be, and stand on their own. But if it becomes possessively interactive, then it changes. There's no freedom. Right. And without freedom, there's no love. Right. So you come back, be self re, self contained. Yeah, I hear you. I uh, I just I I feel like. Um, I feel like, and, and I don't, I'm sorry to take this moment out, we're talking about your art, I, and I, yeah. here I am arguing one uh -huh. of your pieces, that I, I feel like in our society we've all grown up being told that, you know, you're looking for someone else, and that, that woman weeping because, mm -hmm. uh, depressed because she can't find that knight is a product of what she was taught when she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. You want the knight in shining armor, when the fact is, you want to be the knight. Oh. And you don't need to be looking outside of yourself for anything. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So um, working under the, um, the, um, the basic tenant that mm -hmm. there's, we have to be looking out, we have to look for someone else, or we want to become whole because the end goal is finding someone else who is mm -hmm. also whole, removes the initial goal itself, which is become whole yourself. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Which is Sorry, I went off on a tangent. We're here to talk <laughs> about your art. See, it, your art stirred conversation yeah. and that is what I think is the goal yeah. of all art is the conversation that comes after the curtain goes down or after you walk out of the room that has the piece of art and you continue the conversation yeah yeah so um, this is still within your earlier works yes yeah. um, this was in the late 70s it's pastel on paper and I was looking for softness of light softness of color and subtlety of shape, first light of the day. Nice. So it was a very calm feeling that, see what I do is I observe the sky a lot. For 30, over 30 years I've been observing the sky and learning from it. And storing images that 
elicited different feelings in me. And so these were successful to me in that they were simple, and yet a person can feel it. And when many people feel it in the same way, then it's like the painting is being specifically alive. Right. Right. To many people. And that's really, it's like writing a song and an audience just follows it. Then yeah. it's a good work, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the goal. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> to communicate something specific. Yeah. So uh, clearly, oh, I like this one. There's mm -hmm. a lot going on in there. Mm -hmm. It's called Red Dragon. You see the dragon yes. in the center? Um, and the bear and the horse. And the dragon is the only one that's looking back. They're all looking to the right. Oh. But the dragon is looking all around, including back, where we, they came from. The dragon in Asian... Uh, Symbology is the most powerful. And what is the most powerful? It represents knowledge. The most powerful element, force, humanly and spiritually, knowledge. Mm. So the dragon is encompassing everything. And they're all observing something over here. And dragon's widely observing elsewhere everything else yeah so y y you went to um, you went to art school you struggled a little not sure you wanted to stay there was that because you weren't you didn't feel confident in yourself as an artist were you questioning your ability no I knew I still loved doing it and through encouragement and affirmation um, my ability to do successful pieces was encouraged during that time so I've, my growing self-esteem and confidence um, grew. But it was the interruption of, of repeated interruptions of episodes of depression. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why I was, this was happening. It was getting worse and worse. I was getting incomplete, not benefiting from the full semester of knowledge available, technique and skills mm -hmm. available, missing out on a lot of that. That was very frustrating. And it was debilitating of self-esteem, not knowing it was an illness separate from me as a person. I regarded it as a weakness of my character, mm. which was difficult. When I found at age 47, it was an actual illness and it was treatable. Then a, a small journey of about six or seven years to find the right uh, pharmaceutical formula that would work for repressing or even abating the depression of tendencies. And it came to the point where now for quite a few years I've been depression free. So for five or six years I've returned to painting and drawing and painting and continued writing music that um, several songs are about to be recorded and released by Kavika Kahiapo, married to my cousin. Oh. <laughs> yeah, producer, singer, songwriter. Oh, nice. So. I didn't know you wrote music as well. We, uh, okay, hold that thought. We're going to go to our second break. We're going to be back in just a moment, and we'll look at some of Michael's newer works and hear some more about that music. We'll see you in a moment. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. 
Hi, welcome back. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Network. I'm your host, Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater, and we're coming to you from Pioneer Plaza, downtown Honolulu, very near Kumukuhua Theater. I'm talking with artist Michael Yano. We're going to look at, um, I, I very much appreciate that you uh, talked about your depression and going through that and, and how that affected your art, and I'm glad that through the help of pharmaceuticals, you're in a better place now, and your art has evolved along with you. Um, in s to if we, you know, just remember the the piece with the tortured man inside, where the gate was open, but he sure wasn't looking at it. We go from that to blue skies and rainbows and fluffy clouds. The skill is. Um, your skill is obvious, your this, uh, subject matter, the change in the subject matter demonstrates your skill, I think, even more because we can see such a variety of technique and voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like at this point you could create something uh, that told the story of a dark, hard depression like that again? The open gate lithograph yeah. was expressing that. Yeah, but, like, but now uh, that you're healthy, now that yeah. you feel good, yeah. do you feel that you still, if you wanted to, if someone said, mm -hmm. please create another piece like that, I will pay you oh, thousands okay. of dollars, do you feel right. like you could? If you do creative art for a long time, as in acting, uh, and uh, in visual arts as I do, um, you develop how can I say, um, a repertoire of using your skill for expressing different things, some dramatic, some subtle, and some are powerful in their subtlety. That repertoire of skill is very similar to the set of skills with material technique and imagery. And imagery comes from internally. It could be emotionally in the heart, it could be in the mind, mental, analytical, it could come from spirituality, which is where my art, like, oh, look at that. This <laughs> is called Mystic Light. And Mystic Light is, was a commission actually, and sent to Oregon, three feet by three feet. It was the largest painting I'd ever done. She came up with the idea for the commission she wanted light coming through darkness. Mm -hmm. And so I did this piece expressing what I understood about her intention, and she liked it very much. And it's called Mystic Light. It's beautiful. And this is Mystic Light 2. Because I liked it so much that after <laughs> sending that other one off, I went, hey, I, I want to do <laughs> another one, you know? And it also, if I do save it, um, it's a rep it's a represents a pivotal um, work because first of all it's in black and white, still oil on canvas but black and white, gray, white, no color. All of the other paintings they uh, there's concentrated attention to color. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, do you? We, well, we should say. You sell your art at the zoo fence on weekends. Yeah. Are you usually there on both Saturday and Sunday? Yeah, as much as I can, unless a special occasion may come up or something. But uh, yeah, Saturdays and Sundays. Okay, and that's at the zoo fence at the Honolulu Zoo. Yeah. If you come around the Diamond Head side. Montserrat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then that's where you can find. Also, your representing art. my work is Cedar Street Galleries. Oh, okay. Michael Schnack. Is that in Haleiwa? No, that's um, right in the uh, Keomoku and King Street area. Oh, okay. Yeah, right in the middle of, of that part of town. And he has a gallery of panels that pull out, they pull out into the open space. He's got oh, dozens of those. I, Maybe not that many, but a lot. His collection is so impressive. It goes back decades. Mm. And the work is all excellent. And he actually selected seven paintings out of eight I showed him and put some of them on his website. So uh, uh, he's representing me as well. Nice. 
Are you able to support yourself entirely as an artist? Well, I have Social Security ah. and c included with the cash flow from occasional paintings. Then um, I think it, it covers what I need. Covers what I That's need. That's wonderful. Yeah, very well. And there's happiness in my paintings because no matter what, I, what incidents occur, changes or um, there's a contentment of no worry, but the confidence that there is a power that if I live right, things I need will be provided. Mm -hmm. Because when you live right, you give. Aloha. And it goes, aloha goes around. And whether it comes back from the same person or not, or through the kindness of somebody else, the aloha is working. Yeah. Well, you know, and you see that in your paintings, but you also see that you know what the other side looks and feels like. The darkness coming through light paintings, you understand what the darkness looks like. You yeah. Know, I think, had you not had that life experience, yeah. uh, uh, I don't yeah. think you would be able to portray that weight in fluffy clouds, you know, and, and rays of sunlight. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Um, and and you do, here's another one of your pieces that does involve uh, much more color. I love the, I love the color combination of this light blue and the coral, and it's what you see in the sunrises and sunsets, and you see it in fire. If you oh, yeah. at a campfire, you, yeah. you know, you look at the embers after it's been burning for a while, you see right. that coral and light blue. Yeah. I love that color combination. Yeah. With a touch of green sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, oh, thank you. So you, when you were a child, when, when did this painting, when did you start painting? Did, and, and are your parents artists? How did you come by this? No, they're not. Okay. <clears throat> um, they're creative and other skills. Um, business and supporting 10 children and a wife for my father and learning to household growingly with a, eventually 10. Mm -hmm. My skills were free from responsibility, so I could just do what I want, whether it's playing piano, drawing in crayon, um, was very early. And by the time I got to kindergarten, they were doing, you know, different f forms of people and formulaic kind of things and drawing in crayon. And by the time I was in, uh, let's see, it's just a lot of graphite and stuff up until I was about 12, before high school. And I started painting. My mom got this um, paint by numbers, kits, mm -hmm. a couple of them. John Nagy drawing books, which was a how-to perspective and all that. So. Eventually, it got to the point where my first painting came out. And just, it was a portrait of viewing of my uh, concept of Jesus Christ. Oh. I was born and raised Catholic in my family. So Catholic education, um, the story of this man who loved and died, um, had, has always touched me. And I used to draw with the graphite and pen, crucifix, crucified body, mm. you know, um, and felt suffering in the drawing. And eventually got to high school where there's no art. So I went to college and then finally had a chance to check it out and I did it. So. Do you um, feel like the dip the depression was there when you were quite young? Yes, I used to isolate myself, go for long walks, leave the family no matter where they were, what they're doing. There was one time that um, a night gathering of uh, an association of support within a Japanese community. Um, they had games during these dinner parties. And on this one game, I was forced to compete with this girl. She was overweight, younger than me, and no way she's going to win. No way. I, didn't, I said, no, I don't want to play. I don't want to do this. I was forced to do it. 
I felt so bad. This was in the, in the area around Pawa, um, Keomoku and Baratania kind of area. We lived in St. Louis Heights. I just split, man. I just left that whole place and just started walking all night into the morning, get home. They knew I was missing by the time they left. And when I, they just left the door unlocked. And I got home. So from that's my first explicit feeling of experience, actually. I had feelings before that. Sensitivity, I think, and a bit of intelligence mixed to the point of being so sensitive to things, more than most. They don't have that interaction of uh, the dynamic of traumatic stuff inside. So in that, I heard, what I learned is that there's early adversarial experiences that begin a process in the brain, producing or subtracting elements of brain chemistry, which is communication of all cells, every function. So in knowing that, um, learning that, um, there begins to be a pattern that grows. Without treatment, it spirals up and up and up, or deeper and deeper and deeper. And so it, it just got to the point where I was helpless by the time I was 47. Mm -hmm. Periods of weeks that grew to months, that worst case, six months in a year, two times. Very traumatic experiences that I just couldn't handle. So, um, It was pretty much my whole life until treatment with counseling was very important to learn about this illness. And most important, you know, it's a physical illness of the brain. It's not, it had nothing to do with my character. Right. And that's what I, I think a lot of people who suffer from depression, a lot of whom are artists, I, I think most artists I've talked to have some sort of story of depression. Ah. Um, and. I, I'm not sure what that relationship is. If it is we're attracted to art because it's a way to express that and thereby relieve us of some of the pressure, mm. or is it, um, it, can depression come out of a frustration of an inability to, or a desire to communicate? I, I don't know where that comes from. Where that comes from exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm very sorry that I need to wrap up. In okay, the middle really, of your, it's I, been great. I really appreciate um, you talking so candidly about that, and um, I'm glad that you feel better that you're on the other side and you've given us the <laughs> the, this lovely work to look at. Um, and I mm. hope that if there's anyone listening who feels a little, uh, may have questions about the state of um, their own emotional well-being. Yeah. A lot of people want to blame themselves for, oh, yeah. if I would have done this differently, then I wouldn't feel like that. And Which that's traps, not what it, it traps is. them. Yep. When you live in the past in negativity, that's a trap. Your mind is trapped. Yeah, and you don't need to stay there. Don't grow. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here, Michael. I Thank you. It. It's um, been fun. Oh, you know, good. I enjoyed the conversation. Um, there's a few other people I'd like to thank also. I would like to thank Rich Pravis, who's our floor manager. He's right over mm -hmm. there. Thank you, Rich. I'd like to thank Zuri Bender, our studio overlord, who is in my ear, and our producer, Jay Fidel, who somehow manages to put all of this together. We will see you next week here on Center Stage, Wednesdays at 2. Bye.